hello, 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 hello. Technical issues are resolved and I am live. And welcome to the campfire that is Transition Stories. And I I, I, I have to put this up because it, it, it is the most fitting of metaphors that I have seen because it's always delay, 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 delay. Then we go and then we go because that is the metaphor of transitioning in the UK. But welcome everybody in my chat to season three, episode 10 of Transition Stories. And... My guest today, over here, as seen on TV. <laughs> well, Sarah. Hi, uh, you alright? I'm doing very well. I saw you on a show like a decade ago. <laughs> like now you're on my show. I'm like what? <laughs> what is that? What? Big. <laughs> <laughs> Trans people were all like, you know, the same person, just, you know, cutting different ways. Just like different people. Just like, you know, weird and wonderful, wacky people. It's like, ooh, whoop -doo. <laughs> So anyway, how are you? Tell everyone a little bit about yourself and how you ended up here. But first, you should tell everyone about me and my ego. Because, you know, that comes first. Because, you know, I host this I host this shebang and, you know, some people don't like that. But yeah, there you go. I am Phoebe Jo Rose and I am the host of Transition Stories. And I am a trans woman who interviews non-cisgendered people about gender, gender identity, what it means for them. And today I couldn't have done this interview in person because, you know, Brighton is not a very big place. And I could have just wandered around and gone, oh, hello, Sarah. But, you know... <laughs> <laughs> the wonderful, wonderful world of internet. We are going to do this the old-fashioned way, as they say. And Sarah, the floor is yours. Hi. Um, I'm Sarah Savage. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and yeah, as um, Phoebe um, alluded to earlier, about, well, 11, <clears throat> 10 or 11 years ago, I think, I um, transitioned. And at the same time, I did it on a four-part Channel 4 documentary series called My Trans I hate that name, and everybody hates that name too. So I will oh. call it... <laughs> I, will I call wouldn't it have called it that. <laughs> it made it sound like it was like, ooh, I know what you did last summer. <laughs> <laughs> Them transes. <laughs> Those transsexuals in the summer, you know. Don't know what they do in the winter, but, you know, in the summer, they're transsexuals. Ooh. <laughs> But yeah, it was pretty cool. Like, um, and then so I did that, um, and literally the first six months of me transitioning was filmed, um, and we were part of this large show of like seven people. Um, they had an enormous budget, didn't pay us a penny, and we got up in a nice house though in the middle of nowhere. Well, it was it was rented for the weekends, you know, like <laughs> it was it just weekends you were there? Yeah, yeah, there was like seven, five, yeah, seven weekends I think over the course of the summer. That, that we went to visit and you know some of them were like friday to monday um but yeah um they, they squeezed it all in and, and so we had to travel from all over the country to come here for the weekend where was it where on earth was it it was somewhere um near bedford i think oh so it was probably middle um, england yeah yeah so it was probably <laughs> middle england there wasn't like you know an easy place to get to like i know we'll just do somewhere on the other no it's you've probably got to drive to bedfordshire Oh yeah, yeah. Like, like I drove for everyone. I drove from Swansea um, and on my own. And like in the middle of the night, one night I was I was driving home, and it was like three a.m. on a Monday. Like, and, <laughs> you know, like, like yeah, that's the kind of thing it was. So yeah, it was it, obviously everything was edited for TV. It was an amazing house though, and it was really cool to spend time in there. Uh, and, and and it was just so posh, you know. <laughs> So, whilst we're on, on this subject, what did that show do for you as a trans person coming out in 2011? Um, it changed my life completely. Like, the act of transitioning would have changed my life anyway, but being on TV changed my life as well. Um, it was like, <laughs> well, we did so many interviews. Um, and like, you know, I had one cameraman who, who was with me for the whole thing um, and, you know, one producer who came to, to, to do it. And so it, I, they, they asked so many questions and, and they filmed everything. And, you know, like discussions that never made it to camp to, to uh, broadcast um, and, and, you know, basic stuff like, you know, what are you going to be like terrible at your job now because you're trans? And I'm like, no, actually, I'll wake up every morning and not want to kill myself. So 
So perhaps I'll be better at my job, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just one of those things people don't realize. It's like, you know, now I've decided to transition. I'm not actually going to, you know, want to jump off the bridge when I'm walking to the train station, you know? Totally. <laughs> totally. It's like it's the little wounds, little wounds. <laughs> And yeah, so like like doing all that, and, and, and like I like otherwise I would never have, have transitioned and vocalised all my thoughts, and and you know, I like I would never have crystallised these these um these concepts and these ideas and explored them in in a really cool way. Um, and so like I also met really some other trans people for pretty much the first time. I never like met trans people before, um, and became friends with them. Uh, you know, still friends with with um. Pretty, yeah, with everyone pretty much. Um, and like, but then because of the the, the after, what happened after the, the show, like after his broadcast, like like we were legit famous for it for like a month. Yeah, you were. Because you know? I was trans. I started my transition around that time, and partly that show said to me, "Well, sod it, go and do it." Because it because I transitioned, I detransitioned, and then I saw that and went, "Sod it," and then <laughs> and the support group that I was going to. That was the buzz. The buzz was that show. And they would talk about poor old Drew going out and getting drunk. <laughs> and they would talk about uh, Fox, because he was in Brighton and I was in Brighton. It's like, wow, Brighton person on television. Not a trans woman. <laughs> They're trans. Like, boom. <laughs> It'd explode. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like, um, yeah. I mean, like, even among like the cis population, you know, like I had someone chase me down in a shopping centre once because they wanted to take a picture with me. Like, you know, like, 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 you, for a while, you you couldn't go out without expecting to bump into someone who recognised you off the telly. You know? And and like, mostly that was good, but sometimes it was also really scary. Like, cis men. <laughs> They were like, oh, I saw you on TV. And then there's that instant that's like, are you going to kill me? <laughs> are you going to stab me? Are you going to call me names? And then yes. they're like, oh, I loved it. Yeah, I never knew about trans people before. And you were so great. And, because and I remember that there was one episode uh -huh. where they where they had you all do something, which you look back and you go, that's really cringy. And that's really like, ugh. But they had you go to a chaser's bar. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> they had you go, I'll never forget that episode, because they had you go to a chaser's bar. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, like, right, like, you know, it was, it was reality TV. And, well, of course um, it was. It was like the first time the trans people were on telly, and it's like, you know, chasing. <laughs> <laughs> but they put us in situations that, uh, you know, um, I, I would say they manipulated the situation to get a result that they wanted, you know? Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was just, there were so many, like, um, stereotypes that, that we felt that we had to, or I felt that I had to live up to, you know? Um, and and yeah, yeah it, it was just crazy. And, and also because I was like brand new in transition, I hadn't found my confidence. And, you know, I'd just go along with whatever instead of yeah. and now I'd be like, no, nah, I ain't going there. <laughs> nah, Chase's bar. No, I ain't going in there. Chase's bar. No. <laughs> it's like, ooh, that's a Chase's bar. For those of you in the in the in the chat that are wondering, what the bloody hell are these two on about? Chasers bar. So, in short, how would you describe a chasers bar? Right. So, like, <laughs> chasers are, are, are um, usually cisgender men who are completely fetishized our bodies, our existence, um, our lives, and they they just they just. Uh, they just want to suck a cock without feeling gay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, I, I, there's loads of other re different reasons, but uh, that's the joke that I make. Um, you know. <laughs> but like, you know, like, uh, it's and, and so chasers bars are just where where people congregate like this, and you know, in, in large cities. There's one in Brighton. There's one in London. I'm sure there's one in Leeds and yes. Manchester. I know Every where the one in Brighton still is. I know where the one in Brighton still is. It's like, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it's just a bit really weird. But I say, I was walking through Brighton Station once. I mean, I'm about a year into my transition at this time, and I had this guy come up to me and he goes, can I shag you? Why, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Benny Hill moment. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, 
total stranger comes up to total stranger and goes, can I shag you? Woo, he's like, ah, I run away. <laughs> so, I mean, but that was what it was like in the early 2010s in England. I mean, we're talking like 2012, oh 2013 here, and we're not like talking like the 1990s here or even the 1970s here. We're talking like the 21st century, the third millennium. And it's just like a bit weird. But get back to why you're here today, and that's about Channel 4 shows. But segueing through the Channel 4 show, I remember that they filmed a scene where you were in your car and one of your parents was also in the car and your parents said, no, don't want to be on TV, but they filmed you coming out to your parents. How, mom, was, yeah. how was that? And knowing that that was going to be broadcast on television. Weird. Because <laughs> it wasn't, it, can't it? it cannot have been. A, you can't have felt that it was, you had any privacy there. You can't have felt there was any privacy there at all. No, totally not. Like, they're like, <sighs> So, like, uh, there were cameras in the car, like, like two or three cameras inside the car, um, and like I knew how to turn them off. Um, and so we literally we got that sentence that was broadcast, um, and then I turned the cameras off, and then we had a bit of a different discussion. <laughs> because um, I've got another question for you. You're an ex Jehovah's Witness, right? Um. Well, I mean, I, I was someone who was once in that cult, yes. Have you been disfellowshipped? No, I disassociated myself. Okay, because I was gonna, the next question I was going to ask was, well, how come your mother was able to contact you if you'd been disfellowshipped? That was going to be the next question, but you know. Well, um, my, my knowledge of world religions is a bit too niche there for some people, but it's like, yeah. Yeah, but... yeah. yeah so disassociation is the same um, as disfellowship thing. Once you um, are baptised, there's no way to escape the cult. No way to unbaptise yourself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so um, like like technically they weren't allowed to speak to me, um, but like you know I just used to show up at their door and yeah, so it's been really saying I've been um, you know like um, yeah like, like I I've met, I I didn't have much of a relationship with them you know um, any of my birth family and um, then when I came out. Then I mean, like I haven't, I haven't seen uh, pretty much everyone since like I came out to them. <laughs> that was the last time I saw um, like my baby sister, um, my little brother. Um, yeah, that was the last time I saw any of my nieces and nephews. Um, I came out and gone zero contact. How's that been um, for you? Like it's, um, you know. It's character building. <laughs> um, it pisses me off. It, it's like an, an, an open wound that will, will never heal. Um, but like, you know, you, you just fucking get on with it. Like, um, I, there's nothing I can do or say because my, my parents and my whole family have been lied to and, and, and manipulated um, their whole lives, you know, like, like 50, 50 years for my parents that they've been in this cult and this cult has been drumming into their heads that, that Satan will put them to death if they speak. And the him. rapture is coming and every person mm -hmm. who's not a Jehovah's Witness will be killed and yeah. the the paradise will come and the enlightenment is, is just around the corner and it's really quite scary because I say I had a previous guest on here who was a former Jehovah's Witness so I did some research into it and it's really quite mind-blowing oh, yeah. just how manipulative as a cult it is and just how much they believe their own Kool-Aid. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, how, they, like, how, how they actually believe they are God's chosen people and everyone else. So of I think it's under like 30 million Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide, they genuinely drum into people that this 30 million people will be the only people to survive the apocalypse out of the seven billion people on earth. Which is really scary to when you think about that. Mm -hmm. and and yeah so like, i you know i that's how i grew up like fully expecting the end of the world to come um and you know for to, to live forever on a paradise earth where i could like have lions as pets because they wouldn't want to eat me anymore apparently <laughs> um <laughs> you know and and so what what I, I left the the cult um when i was still a child i was well legally you know i was 17 um and like Every single person who'd ever spoken to me stopped speaking to me. 
you like the, the cross of the road in front of me to not speak to me um like the 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 mum of a family who were like you know we were best friends growing up throughout all of our lives called me to our house and she was like if you die i can't go to your funeral um if you leave mm-hmm. <laughs> wow <laughs> that's it that, that's a, that's a level of incredible that is mm-hmm. because i come from a very large irish family and there's a lot of you know tensions and stuff but the one thing that you can always guarantee well there's three things that you can always guarantee that will get the family back together and that is first communion a wedding and a funeral yeah <laughs> those are the three things that will get the family back together mm-hmm. but, to be I, told, I but to be told i can't even come to your funeral that must have been really quite jarring as a 17 year old to hear that oh my god yeah yeah it's horrible like like no wonder I spent like until I was twenty five just taking over drugs all the time <laughs> and, and drinking too much. It was, Were they it was good drugs? incredibly traumatic. Oh yeah, I lived on Ibiza. It was the best drug. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so like you know, like they call it shunning, um, and and um, it's an act of love to shun someone who's left. So if my, my parents are, are absolutely, and my whole birth family are adamant that that. The reason or that that it's my fault that they don't speak to me um and it's it's up to me to do the thing to go back into their cult and then they'll speak to me they view you as an apostate do they view do they call you do they class you as an apostate i'm sure they do yeah (laughs) i've got um i've got on my wrist oh my god i have the number six 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 tattooed on my wrist So there you go. So the number six 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 on the on the inside of my wrist, there. and that um, yeah, I showed that to my mum, um, and yeah, that, that kind of finished <laughs> any hope she had that I would ever come back to put the light. <laughs> <laughs> so how did growing up in a cult that calls itself a religion affect how you viewed yourself and how you viewed your own gender identity? Um like so much guilt so much guilt <laughs> um and you know like um i i th- there was always like loads of, of bargaining you know like i i um there was there was a, a great scandal in our house um the when we got the internet one of the first things that that went into the um search history was, was some gay porn and some lesbian porn <laughs> you know i mean like, i was like 14, no no you know i was 14. <laughs> yeah <laughs> For those of you who aren't aware, uh, the Jehovah's Witness cult says that you can't look up things like pornography, etc. You can have sex, but only in a marriage, and you can only marry someone who is also a Jehovah's Witness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, and and so like I, you know, like my my sexuality, my gender identity was always used as a stick to beat me with. Um, you know, well, like like um, I feel my, my earliest memory was with me in a dress um, when we went to a, a fancy dress party, and I was dressed as Moses. Moses has a dress on in the Bible. <laughs> I Did you have a big it. stick as well? Yeah, yeah, and buttons on my chest. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you know, like, like, uh, you know, what, I remember being accused by my dad of being gay a few times, and and you know, I, I had no clue where that came from because I didn't know that I was back in camp or whatever, you know, and. Like the, you know, so that it it puts a lot of guilt and and, and a lot of self hatred into you, um, you know, and and somehow I don't know I got over it because you know by the time I was like eighteen, nineteen, um, you know I told my friends that you know I dressed up as a woman sometimes and was completely open with all of these people in my life, you know, so like I, it was it was really I, I hated that I had to hide so much of me from the people close to me, you know, like. Um, you always feel like you're walking on eggshells because you know any time you show the wrong emotion or the wrong look or whatever you know you're going to get shouted at and then but it was really cool that i i fell into a, a, a big group of friends um and i made the decision the decision not to hide anything from them right so like very early on like i i you know i just I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought of anything of, of it, but I came out to them. You know, I was just like, by the way, I'm bisexual. Um, and then a bit later on, it was actually, I don't just like dressing up as a woman. I am a woman. 
you know and so like these were the first people to know basically like, just after me um so yeah it was really cool that you know i found a new family um and pretty much you know i've lived in different places around the world and, and i found new families in every place i've gone so you make your so own family again you you really do and i say did you ever mourn the loss of your birth family um i still do <laughs> like you know i i know um how you know my parents are not nasty people they're not they're not bad people they're good people um and and they they, they raised me well um but like you know i i know that they've been manipulated i forget the question i was going from that sorry <laughs> what I, was said, question? I said so do you mourn your birth family <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I know that they they're good people and they hold these beliefs in good faith, right? You know, they're not being nasty about it. They're just they're, they're just being manipulated. Um, and so I know that there's there's no way that they're going to come to their senses and leave, and wake up um, and leave the cult. You know, like you know, I I, I, I it's 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 never going to happen. They they're, they're going to have wasted their entire lives with with not speaking. Um, and there's not even going to be a moment when I'm going to be like, ha, I fucking told you so. You know, like, you know, I won't even know they're sick. I'll just get a message one day. Um, and so, yeah, you, I, I mourn the fact that I can't speak to them. I, I mourn the, who they are. But it's been so long now that I can't even see them in my head. Um, you know, I don't look them up online. <laughs> I used to. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it's just like I've got better things to do in my life right now. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I've described it as an open wound, you know, and it'll never heal. Um, I've just got to learn to deal with it. I've got to learn and to I make sure it doesn't get infected. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. So, you say that coming out on the TV show was one of the things that you found quite liberating, and you found a group of friends for the first time. So when the cameras switched off and the show finished, what what did you do next? What was next for Sarah Savage? Okay. Uh, so what, uh, you know, um, I, I've spoken about this publicly as well. <laughs> um, uh, at the same time as all of this was being filmed and I was coming out, I was in an abusive relationship. And a, about a week before the first show went live, um my ex left the house to do some shopping and i threw armfuls of everything that i had into the back of my volvo and i cleared off um and then i arrived in london um i had nowhere to go um but i managed to get in contact with someone from who i met on on the show and um he said that i could come stay with him for a couple of nights and then Fox was like, I'll oh, come down to Brighton, you can stay with me for a couple of nights, and I knew one other person in Brighton. So I came down to Brighton and you know, I was one step away from living in my car. Um, just the the the, the friendliness of, of a couple of people. Um and then I got in, into contact with um a, a domestic violence charity and they gave me a place in refuge. Um and so I stayed in refuge for nine months. Um and then Kind of um, during that time was also it was really healing as well because like you know I had like um, um, sessions with a, a counselor and um, it was it was just a really nice safe space to be um, and kind of process everything that had happened. But you know um, at the same time um, you know we were we were famous for a month or so and, and, and everybody wanted a piece of us um, and you know we were doing like club tours. Um, which was horrible. Uh, not a clubber. Uh, uh, I mean, not anymore. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I do remember, I do remember seeing advertising for that. It's like the My Transsexual Summer Club Tour. It's like, and I felt really, really uncomfortable seeing that advertising. <laughs> I, I genuinely felt uncomfortable seeing that advertising. But yeah, I mean, like, you know, uh, Club Revenge in Brighton. Um, oh, good God, yes. They, they had a 30 foot sign. Uh, yes, they out, did. Um, with, with, I've still got a picture of it. With, with oh, I remember. <laughs> because Club Revenge, for those of you who don't know Brighton very well, Club Revenge is a mecca 
kind of place that you go to if you are a member of the lesbians or trans femme community. If that's where you go. That is your mecca. And I will never forget this sign when it went up. And I was driving past it and I went... <laughs> Because it was really quite intimidating. Because there's a couple of roundabouts there, and it's on. It's on. It's just off Marine Parade, <laughs> and you cannot miss it because it's got this prominent <laughs> corner location, and it was just enormous, great thing. Mm. Yeah, I don't. So, but so also, what we did, right? Or you know, club event. It was really lame, but like, like, <laughs> they were like, oh, we're we'll in the VIP area, right? Just like some seats in the corner with, with a bit of rope across, and, and they bring you and they bring you occasionally some nachos. Yeah, I, I, this must have been before nachos. I mean, like wow. we got free vodka, but that was about vodka. It. <laughs> and then everyone was like, oh, like lining up to take their photos of us, and like some of them didn't even know who we were. They just wanted their photo with someone in the VIP area. It was so stupid. Um, <laughs> and then. Um, <laughs> But I snuck away from that night and, and I met some random person who had like two inch air tunnels in and and like she took me to a, a um a, to a bulldog <laughs> and then we stayed there and partied all night like <laughs> that's much better yeah that's much better <laughs> or, or if you really wanted to you know have a different kind of night just go around the corner for sublime just go around the corner to some time and you can have a completely different night. <laughs> Let's put it this way. They wouldn't be queuing around there. <laughs> but... Yeah, another thing that was really cool was like, I started getting invited to um, like small charities um, and um, conferences uh, and pride events. So the, the, the first big one, or the, the first one that really kind of like um, inspired me was actually at Stonewall Housing. Um, They're good people. They are amazing people. Uh, and, and 10 years, 11 years later, the same people still work for them. That's how much of a cool place it is. Stonewall Housing provides um, like emergency housing for um, LGBTQ plus young people in London. Um, so say I work in housing as my day job. Mm. And they are the go-to people when we have the LGBT community present to us. They are the go-to. Stonewall Housing do fantastic work for the LGBT community. They are just amazing. And this is not a sponsor or anything, but they are just fantastic. Oh, yeah. So look up their website and give them money, please. Um, so yeah, well, um, so uh, they invited um, the whole like, well, I think there was four or five of us ended up turning up to the London offices, and they had like a um, like a support meeting with all their service users, uh, and then you know we were all in a room, and then we all had really nice chat, and then we did some photos, and they were just really lovely people, and then they invited me to march with them um, at London Pride, London World Pride, I think it was that year, and. You know, this is my first time, you know, I have such a large pride. Uh, and they gave me uh, a megaphone. And if you've seen Trans Pride in any year since, you'll know how much I love a megaphone. <laughs> I've been to a couple. I say I was at the very first Trans Pride. And I say oh, one of my friends was on the committee of Trans Pride. Um, Phoenix was on the committee. I love Phoenix. And I love Phoenix too. And I love Phoenix too. But we'll talk about Phoenix after the show. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, you and a megaphone are very good friends. Mm -hmm. Which is why so, I think yeah, you to come on here because you get another megaphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that that March, that London March, was was the first time that that I discovered like my confidence, um, you know, and my voice, and uh, it was just so empowering um, and. Uh, the you know the people from Stonewall Housing were just so amazing, and you know we went for a um, you know, fried drink afterwards, and but yeah, I just found it so inspiring. And since then, I also I've been invited to so many different prides around the country. Um, you know, from from you know World Pride London with with three hundred thousand people in the march to I've been to a pride event in Hereford uh, where it was literally a dozen people in a pub and. Um, they paid my travel up there to tell some jokes, <laughs> bad jokes. I am not. I am not very good at jokes. And you know, and, and 
But like, I've been to so many different kind of events and, and from tiny, tiny, tiny things, huge corporate entities. And I, yeah, that's pretty much why I got so heavily into trans pride very early on. So what does pride mean? What does it mean for you as somebody who is ingratiated into pride and has set up and is now the chair of trans pride Brighton? Um, me, it's like meeting people, finding a community, you know, connecting with people that, um, on a level that, that I haven't connected with anyone really before, you know, um, and that's essentially what, what Pride is for me. It's, it's about community, um, and it's about the experiences you meet the, the, and the people that you meet. Um, yeah, that's Pride is. So you are at a place where you've come out and you've got a good group of friends. You're not living in your car anymore. You're not living in a refuge anymore. So why did you pick up a pen and start writing books? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you're very good at it, though. You're very good at writing those books. That's all I'll say. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so... so well, Do you call uh, yourself a children's author? Um, if I want to impress someone, yeah. <laughs> children's author, uh, you know, children's <laughs> author on the show, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everyone else who's not a lady or a gentleman. Published. <laughs> published in multiple languages. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. So, right, I, right I, I did really well at school, you know, um, and then, like, I left school um, and the whole thing in the end of the world thing was going to end. But, oh. uh, so, <laughs> but I, I went to, uh, um, I, I got a job at a Rolls Royce garage um, as a mechanic, uh, an apprentice mechanic, the Rolls Royce um, guy. Um, so I, I never really wrote anything since school. Uh, you know, I was always, like, my, I was really good at, like, creative writing at school, but I just never had a reason to afterwards. And then um, I transitioned and everything happened. And it was about that time I started a blog. <laughs> and like like loads of people started reading my blog and, and I was just chatting about media and stuff that I'd done. And like, you know, I just, it just was filled with my attitude. Um, and, and apparently some people have told me that I've got away with words. So it seemed to resonate with people. Um, and then, you know, like, like deep down, I've always kind of thought I, I've got a couple of books in me, you know. Um, but then when my trans summer happened, one of the lines on it was something like they don't make fairy tales for trans kids. And, you know, that really stuck with me and, and Fox. Um, and so we decided, well, why don't we do a children's book um, um, for trans children? And that's how Are You a Boy or Are You a Girl came about. Um, I think I was sat around at, at Fox, in Fox's living room and we were, you know, going over ideas, figuring, trying to figure out what to, what to write about. And, yeah, the idea came to me, well, why don't we have a child who we don't say what their gender is? Um, and, you know, maybe that will work. So, yeah, um, I kind of just sat down and, and I wrote out a story. <laughs> and that's how it came to be. <coughs> so... When you were writing the book, did you write about yourself in any way in the book? No. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. yeah, I mean, like, I I wrote about how a, 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 a good interaction would be, you know. Um, you know, I, I wanted it to be really basic and, and just an explainer. I didn't want to start trying to be, um, you know, like, like Dr. Zeus. Um, I don't. Yeah, I didn't want to start writing this this, this story and, and and get caught up in my pretensions. I wanted a book that would be um, used as an educational tool, as a common conversation starter. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was just literally this is the problem. This is the solution to the problem. Um, and then, you know, like I've always got on with kids, and and I want you know like. I had a sister who was like 14 years younger than me and, and I read her stories, um, you know, all the time. And, and you know, I just, yeah, I, I think I, I, I was, you know, secretly a children's author all along. I just didn't <laughs> quite know it. 
And then, and then, and then it led to your second book, which I think is in a way slightly more controversial of a topic in today's climate because of the title, She's My Dad. Mm -hmm. So where did the inspiration for that book come from? Um, so again, <laughs> a lot of the feedback that we had from, from um, um, Are You A Boy or Are You A Girl is um, there's, no, there, there's, there's loads of stories about gender variant children um, or you know but like uh, the first I, I, we, we kick-started the book in 2015 um, and then so I think it was 2019 that my first that my second book came out um, maybe even later I'm not sure uh, <laughs> and so uh, in that time like the publisher had been um, getting loads and loads of, of trans and gender variant authors uh, published and so there was this big glut of, of books where there was you know the trans kid was the center and that was amazing but a few people had said how do i explain my transition to, to, to my child um you know what why how why is the focus always on the trans child why is it always not why is it about why is it not about a cisgender child who has trans people in their life um and so um yeah, uh, she's my dad. Came about because I just wanted a way of of for um, you know trans people who have a, a kid, um, a young person, a child, or an, a, a, you know a, a nibbling, um, and they just want to explain that they're transitioning. Um, and so yeah, that's that's kind of how it came about. Um, that one and well, the the book three, um, he's my mum. Um, is kind of you know it's polar opposite. The, the, the stories are, are very similar and, and again i use like stereotypes um you know like really like like basic stereotypes to act as springboards for discussion um as you know like you know yeah, the, the the reader is 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 going to be like oh you think that that's you know, a boy thing or a girl thing you know and yeah it's just really basic um simple stuff explainers for for children who have no knowledge of trans issues at all um yeah, I just like to, you know, just keep them short and cute and, and hope that, that that if you educate kids from a young age um, and you show them that the transitioning is normal, being non-binary is normal, and that stereotypes are, 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 are pointless, then they'll grow up into, into really kind of emotionally mature, accepting adults. And do you think that you're helping to have a positive influence on society in general considering the toxicity that goes on at the moment do you think that you're making a positive contribution to society and did you ever envisage that that would be something you would do um <clears throat> yeah i mean like absolutely it's a positive thing on society because there are so few trans folks <laughs> honestly they just shout very much um and and yeah, you know, I, I I have people getting in contact with me about the books. Um, you know, like the the first ones, they're still discovering the first one. Um, and you know, people are are, are saying, "Oh, this is amazing! I've wanted to try and explain this to my child for so long." You know, like it's it's impossible not to have a positive impact on stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I never imagined that that it would be me doing the positive change. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like like. Um, after leaving the cult, um, there was there was so much trauma, and 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 I you know I reacted to it in in less than healthy ways. You know, I drank, I smoked, I I practiced escapism at every chance I had. Um, and so, like, you kind of start thinking, oh, this must actually be me. I must be this lifelong fuck up who can't keep a job. <laughs> um, and then, like, you know, after. I, I, I don't, and, and I tell people how much MTF changed my life, and, and it's impossible to overstate that. You know, I, I since then, you know, I, it's been it's been a journey, um, and it wasn't a light switch, but like I take myself more seriously. I've got confidence in my abilities. I know what I can achieve now because we've done you know such amazing things over the years. You know, um, yeah, I, I never would have thought that that I'd have been possible. I think it would be possible that I'd, I'd be this person, you know, like, you know, like even now, you know, like with, with 
Travis cried. Like I, I'd, I'd tell my friends back home what I'm doing, and they're like a little bit like dumbstruck because they never would have thought that I'd do something like that, let alone be well at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard to underestimate and understate just how groundbreaking MTS was, mm-hmm. because <clears throat> for me, it was the first neutral exposure that I had had to trans people. It wasn't a sensationalist exposure. And it said to me, go on then. And it was was a bizarre thing to say that a television show could do that in in the 2010s. But where do you see that British society has gone from when you did MTS to today? And has it gone in a positive direction? Has it gone in a negative direction? Or has it largely stagnated? Or has it done something completely different? So, for a number of years, everything got so much better. Like, um, you know, it's hard to, to, like, on on your point of, of how groundbreaking NTS was, like like before that like if, if you were trans and on tv you were either on in the news about yourself being murdered or um you were you a were, murderer yeah yeah essentially um and and so there was like the old niche program late night on channel four where trans people only existed to have lower surgery and look ridiculous um you know <laughs> well and then be shown as being ridiculous people um what i mean um, you know, by by nefarious editors and filmmakers um, who wanted to play on stereotypes, and then yeah, so like like it just showed us as people doing normal stuff, you know, like like Drew got a job, <laughs> you know. Wow, I, I was, trans person is employed. Yeah, exactly, you know, like 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 Fox had friends, <laughs> you know, like and, and it was just basic stuff like this, and and yeah, it hadn't been shown, and and the goodwill from that from that documentary carried pretty much a lot of, of, of the positive trans sentiment you know until 2016 17-ish because it set such a good precedent you, know, you, you could not that there were very few attempts over the years to, to put trans people on tv um but every single one of those shows was compared back then yeah um and you know, uh, but there were ones that, that showed people being. I used to rant about this on my blog all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, there were shows that really objectified us, and then and then I put out a blog and crystallised exactly why. Um, and but also because this is high blogging, um, you know, fifty other people would do it, and and everyone would be sharing this on Twitter about you know, and and you get some really new thoughts on 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 every situation, and the 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 anti-trans opposition weren't really all that organized you know like beyond like rod little in the sun and and columnists um you know mom's net hadn't been taken over by the transphobes yet um, it was still <laughs> a site where people went to get like parenting advice yeah i know right <laughs> it's like my god mom's net towers it's like it's been invaded by you know not very nice people <laughs> Mums Net Towers used to be like a, a term of affection instead of now it, it, it feels like yeah. this like adversarial castle in the sky, you know. It's the ultimate in ivory towers. Mm, absolutely. Quite quite an apt name. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, like I think the thing that changed really is is the is, is how organized the transphobes got. Um and and just how much money they seem to have managed to generate. Well, yeah, they got really connected with like the Christian fundamentalists in America, and and you know, like the the kind of person that the, the just kind of donate a hundred grand to a cause. Just to it was it's like way. today there. I saw yesterday somebody just dropped fifty grand on a crunch, on a crowdfunder to sue Stonewall. Oh wow! Just <laughs> dropped fifty grand on it. As you do, you know. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like this this kind of organization. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the American fundamentalist right had had left the UK alone for a number of years. You know, there was a little bit of a resurgence in the equal marriage um, um, debate that, that came about. Yeah. 
and and I think that you know it was obvious that they were going to lose, um, and I think that uh, a lot of the people driving that changed their focus to, to trans people in the coming years. Because I'm going to say something very controversial here. Theresa May tried her best. She really did try her best. But she's the reason that we have what we have today because she decided to do that consultation on the Gender Recognition Act. She thought she was doing the right thing. I genuinely believe that. Mm -hmm. But that is why we're in the situation we are today because it gave them the platform that they needed. Yeah, totally. I genuinely believe yeah. she did that for all the right reasons. I genuinely thought that she had seen as Home Secretary just how horrendous it was. And she was then going to go, well, okay, what did the community want and what did the community want to change? But it got hijacked by ridiculous organisations like Citizens Go and WPUK yeah. and KPSS and <coughs> I'm not even going to mention a name on this stream because she's a fascist. <laughs> They're all fascists. <laughs> like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, it's yeah, it's it's just so stupid, and 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 these people are now like professional activists, anti-trans activists. The grift you know, like, keeps they, them in employment. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, you've just got to look at FPFW. It employs its founder. FPFW employs wow. its founder. And there's two reasons why it employs its founder. <laughs> there's two reasons why it employs the founder. The first one is it gives the founder the corporate veil, so she can't be personally sued. And the second one is it is actually a way of her looking legitimate. You're not giving to the founder, you're giving to FPFW. Yeah, totally. It's such a scam in it. Like, you know, so <laughs> yeah, I well, um we were I ran a uh, fundraiser for um I where I were girl. <laughs> and in 30 days, uh I we raised five thousand pounds. Um and I, did, I was astonished, right? <laughs> and and you know, I remember crying with, with relief. Um, and I made I made it with about two days to, to spare. Um, and yeah, but just, just that was just five grand, and and then people were just buying the book in advance, essentially. <laughs> uh, but but to think just just putting up a, a crowdfunder and and you know having fifty grand donated to you, and it, I'm just going to spend that on myself. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a crowdfunder going out, out at the moment that's asking for a half million pounds. Oof. And that's Oof. the one that had 50 grand just dumped on it. A half yeah. million pounds. It's madness. It is, isn't it? Wow. If I had a half million pounds coming my way, my goodness, <laughs> all my worries would be gone. I'd be able They're to, right. you know, I'd be able to, you know, Live mortgage free and things like that. It's like amazing, but it's just like it, mm. it astounds me that this is not being challenged by people who are very well educated people who have seen this all before. You saw this in the 1950s and 60s when you had the migration from the Commonwealth. You saw this in the 70s and 80s when you and the 90s when you had gay people, lesbians, bisexuals, etc. And now in the 2000s, the 2010s, the 2020s, it's you, me, and everyone else who's trans. We've seen it all before. It's just cyclical. Yeah, and totally. Why it's not being challenged mm -hmm. is one of those things that amazes me. And the question I wanted to ask you. That's somebody who's been at this a while, like I have. Where do you think this ends? <laughs> Good question. <clears throat> like, <clears throat> the, there will always be um, anti trans people. It's like there will always be homophobes. There will always, always be racists. Be racist. mm -hmm. um, It'll just become less socially acceptable to, to shout it from the rooftop, and so that you know uh, there will be there will be a point where trans people get there. Um, you know we'll, there will be a point where we'll be able to self-identify, and you know we'll be able to <laughs> choose you know what kind of healthcare is correct for us. Um, but you know it's it's going to take um, at least. A double labor government, you know, it's it's it will 
it will never come with with a right wing government um, or a conservative government. It's going um, to take a long period of time without the conservatives there. And I worry about a Labour government because of some of the elements in that. But you've got it, it's going to need, in my opinion, trans people to actually start to coalesce and actually start to do a lot more than what we currently do. And it needs to be off of Twitter. And it needs to be off of Instagram. But that's just my opinion. And what do you think? So, like, we've, we've always come together and we've always coalesced. And, and, you know, like, I remember being in a, in a meeting um, when Stonewall was deciding whether the, they were going to support us or not. <laughs> You know, and, and, and there were like 50 of us trans notable trans athletes in the room. Um, <clears throat> you know, like that kind of thing has always happened. I, I think that the, the thing that is going to change is, um, overall, the thing that will affect the biggest change is allies or our allies and allies who, who un, 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 unashamedly, unabashedly sh shout from the rooftop their support for trans rights and trans following. Um, you know, and that's that's starting to happen, absolutely. Um, and their voices are starting to become louder. And I, you know, I, I th there's only so much that that we as a community can do. You know, it's it's not like um, the gay community where what five percent of people are, you know come out. Um, there are so few of us. But, but we, I'm not sure we can get critical mass. <laughs> you know, we, we can we, we can affect huge change um, by reaching out and asking allies and, and, and over the years taking up positions in, of leadership and, and change. Um, but I think the key is, is going to have to be um, you know, widespread this support. Um, and yeah, we're getting there. Um, we, there's just got to be a, a, a better counter to some of the, you know, false but surface believable narratives. It just calls yeah. to emotion. Yeah, yeah, totally. They're not based in the science, and they're just calls to emotion. Mm -hmm. But as we're coming towards the end of this interview portion, I wanted to ask one question that I ask a lot of my guests here. So, age 17, you leave the Jehovah's Witness cult. And Sarah Savage today can meet 17-year-old you. Can meet 17-year-old Sarah. What would 17-year-old Sarah say to Sarah today? And what would Sarah say to 17-year-old Sarah? Um, um. <laughs> Don't spend that large check when you get in your late twenties. <laughs> <laughs> um, like honestly, nothing. Um, I, I, I don't. I wouldn't change a thing about the experiences I've had and the things that I've learned. And I wouldn't change a thing about the mistakes I've made either. Um, you know, I wish that the obviously I wish I would have transitioned sooner. I think, that's, um, I think that's a common thing that even yeah. even people who transitioned really young say, because I say I transitioned when I was age 20, and I say, well, I wish I'd done it sooner. Mm. Yeah, yeah, everyone does. Um, you know, and, and, and I think 20-year-old me or 17-year-old me would either, like, tell me to fuck off or <laughs> said nothing at all and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> Benny Hill alone. Ah! <laughs> oh, man, I did like I did for the man in the train station. <laughs> ah! Yeah, I mean, you know, like like uh I I it, everything that's ever been has has shaped me and molded me into who I am. And I really fucking like myself for today, who I am. I like the space I'm in. Um, I like the headspace I'm in, you know, and and um yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it, yeah. There's, there's nothing really that that I would I would want to change, you know. Um, yeah. 
I'm all done. To quote, to quote uh, the TV show Frasier, are you happy? Fuck yeah. <laughs> and like, um, I, I mean, so I don't know how much more time we've got. Um, I would love to tell you about the main reason. You can then... tell me the main reason all you want, and we can go a little bit over the hour. I like to keep it to an hour because you know, then it's some consistency, and I've got like a thing to work for. But if the guest wants to keep talking, with the guest. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, like the big thing that's made me happy uh, this week is um, um, a dream that has that started in in twenty eleven. Um, oh no, sorry, in twenty thirteen. Um, in 2013, we started Birth Trans Pride, and one of the conversations we had was um, where we wanted Trans Pride to go over the future. And one of the big, one of the things that I remember saying was, we need to get some property. We need to have a place in the middle of Brighton where we can have and and be a trans space, a trans run space um, in the middle of town. It's never been done before. Um, and so, um, actually, after filming of the 2021 Trans Pride Brighton, um, someone told me that, that a space might be available, and I have been, I have been working so hard to make this happen, and, and everyone at Trans Pride has been working so hard to make this happen, and um, we signed the lease um, to um, a place in St James Street middle of the gay quarter in brighton um and we signed the lease without really knowing how we were going to pay for it uh <laughs> and then um i've been applying to different funds and, and grants and charities and um, i got news last week that we have um, um essentially been given twenty five thousand pounds um to run what will be called the trans pride center um for the next 18 months. So um, we're going to call it the Trans Pride Centre and we're going to run it as a mini community centre for, for small groups of trans and non-binary people who haven't got any money to, to rent a room or to even become an official group. Um, so we're going to give them support to be able to uh, um, um, constitutionalise themselves, um, um, apply for funding if that's what they want to do, um and yeah it's going to be amazing it's yeah it's going to be amazing and and so the the, the twenty five thousand pounds has come from um it was arranged or it was distributed by lgbt consortium um it's that lgbt features equity fund and it is the fund is provided for by the national lottery recently. um and it's amazing like like yeah, I'm emotional too. <laughs> you know, um, as someone who lived in Brighton and as someone who went to the very first trans pride, but then fell out of the community and then has recently come back to the community, I have a lot of regrets about why I left the community, and I had an opportunity that I passed by to be involved with trans pride. I passed it by, and I will always, to the this day, still regret that because I had an opportunity. Because I was approached by the person who used to run the Claire project, and they said, This is starting. I won't mention their name because I don't know whether they are comfortable with that, but assuming you know who I mean. And they said, Do you want to be involved? And I, to this day, will always regret the decision that I made. And that was because I said, No. Come join us. Still time. <laughs> Um, yeah, to hear us. that to hear that is something that always makes me well up because I started this show back in June last year, and to have you say that on this show, it's amazing, isn't it? Like, like, like I, I cried, like absolute tears, blubbering tears. When I found out that, that the relief, when I found out that, that we'd got the money, um, and you know, this it's oh, never okay. been done before, you know, like, like we've always been given a piece of the, the pie, you know, like we've always been given, oh, you can have it, you can have it, you know, have that and, and be happy with it. And, and for the first time, you know, we've got the whole pie for ourselves and we can decide exactly what we do with it. 
you know, we're, we're, we're not beholden to anyone apart from other trans. We cooked this pie people. ourselves. We've made the pastry. We've made the filling. <laughs> We've even made the tin that it's gone in. <laughs> We haven't quite made the oven, but we've made the tin, the pastry, and the filling, and everything. And you know, it's our pie for the first time ever. And so cool! So that's cool. amazing. That's that is genuinely amazing. And you heard it here first, people. You heard it here first. Don't. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, like as a committee, we've talked about this from the from the start years ago. You know. And just like like I've got the keys, and and you know like we we you know there's a binder exchange, a binder library that we can be like, you can have this space for nothing, right? And and you know there's there's an addiction support group that that we can be like, I don't care, you just come in here and, and you have your thing, and and we'll help you out. And uh, I like like uh, it, it's this radical community support that that is what pride should be about. Um, um, it's such a privilege to be able to be a part of that. And I couldn't think of a better way to end this show other than to say this is what trans power looks like. This here is what trans power looks like. It's not what the lunatics make out to be. This is what it is. It's about helping those who are the most vulnerable members in our community to have that leg up when they have been told by every other service and they're made to feel that every other service is not for them because of this rampant hate that is pushed by an agenda that is out to not exclude us from society, but to eliminate the ability for us to exist within mm -hmm. society and within our own private lives. And just, just know that the city where I live in, the city where I did my transition is gonna be doing this. If I had had this space when I was first transitioning, I don't know quite how different it would have been for me, but it's just fantastic to hear that. It's just fantastic. It's just absolutely fantastic. So mm -hmm. Sarah, where could people find you and what have you got to shill apart from, you know, making lives better and, you know, educating <laughs> children and educating parents? <laughs> what else have you got? Oh, I mean, like, you can find me on social media, um, Osiris Awich. Um, it's somewhere, it's somewhere really, in the ticker below down here. Yeah, I don't really care about social media anymore. Uh, <laughs> um, Transpiredbrighton.org. Um, please donate to us. Um, um, help us change the world. If, if you're privileged enough to have some spare money, then then, then that's how we. Um, it's all on the website. If you have some free time that you would like to donate to Transpride, you can um, either join the committee. Um, we've got lots and lots of work at the moment. Um, or you can volunteer to be a steward on the day or help out with the protest march. Um, everything's on our website under the Get Involved tab. So I, I, I don't, I'm at a loss and I'm at a loss for words and people in my chat that have watched these episodes will know that to get me at a loss for words is, is one of the hardest things you can do. <laughs> but I've got to sign off this episode and I'm forgetting what my sign off is. As, <laughs> I, as, as I say, um, you only get one life and live okay. that one life to the best that you can. This has been an emotional episode for me and my guest today has been Sarah Savage and this has been season three episode 10 of Transition Stories and Transition Stories is a joint production of Phoebe J Rose and Odd Tech Man and to all of my mods who are on the discord server who are on Twitch and who are on Twitter thank you ever so much for giving up your free time on a Sunday afternoon to come and moderate this. And to all my viewers, please share and do what you can to make this show even bigger and better than what it is. Because without the people watching it, I'd just be somebody talking to a stranger on the internet. So until next time, live that one life to the best that you can.